Sabbath church. Let's pray a time. Let us all kneel and seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for letting us come here today. We thank you for the privilege of uh, seeing another day. There are many people in this world who started the week but didn't finish the week. There are many people who went to bed last night but didn't wake up this morning. The future is not promised to anyone, either the young, the old, the healthy, the sick. We thank you for giving us the privilege to breathe again. Heavenly Father, we come here today to worship you, to hear your message. Heavenly Father, there are several individuals that are going to be given the message today. We pray that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, could work in us so that the message can resonate in our hearts and the work will continue to work in us and transform us to be citizens of your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we as human beings are flawed. We are full of sin. We are going through many uh, difficult times, tribulations, trials, all of different sorts, different kinds. We pray that you would help us in our lives, help us 
whatever troubles that we have, whatever issues that we're going through. Heavenly Father, it's not just here in our church, but all throughout the world. There are many people who are suffering from disease, from poverty, from famine, from war. We pray that you would help those people and help us as well, O oh Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for, for, for uh, forgiveness for our sins and our trespasses. We pray that you will uh, not count it against us, O oh Lord. Help us. Give us that grace, O oh Lord. Be with us, O oh Lord. We pray that, you know, at the end, uh, you will continue to bless us and keep us. And when we finish here and we go about our separate ways, that you will give us traveling mercies. You will protect us for another week so that we may come next week to praise and worship you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the things you've done for us. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for having a plan to save this world. We thank you for loving us even though we are full of sin and we're not even close to perfect. Heavenly Father, thank you for all these, all these things. Thank you for your plan and everything that you have for us, O oh Lord. All these things we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. the special music we it's a prayer song to the Lord our Savior and we're going to have the words on the screen so you can follow along and make it your prayer too Jesus said I am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and I in him shall bear much fruit for without me you can do nothing hands and lift them up for I have not the strength to praise you near enough see I have nothing I have nothing without you
Thank you, praise team. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. We are continuing our series on God's movements through history. For the past few weeks, we saw how God has been moving his people from Noah's time to the children of Israel, the early Christian church, and the church in the wilderness. We see that for thousands of years, God has been predicting his son's second coming through his prophets. And today, we will focus on the Advent awakening that happened right here in the United States. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts that we may receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. No, God, no! I cannot preach. Those were the words of William Miller before he surrendered to God's will for his life and became one of the leaders of the Great Advent Movement. William Miller grew up on a farm with his family in Lowhampton, New York. Though poor and with short periods of formal education, he would often find himself sitting by the fireplace reading in his log cabin just like Abraham Lincoln. His family was Baptist, and for a while, he began to wonder about his soul. He would often lead a strict life of submission to his parents and gave up some of his most prized possession, but he could not find peace, and his efforts were fruitless. Miller was married to his wife, Lucy, in 1803 and lived in Pulteney, Vermont. There, he made acquaintances with men who did not believe in God. They introduced him to the writings of David Hume, Voltaire, and Thomas Paine. And soon, he accepted deism. Deism is not a religion, but rather a perspective on the nature of God. These believe that God exists, but does not interfere with the functioning of the natural world but allows it to function according to the laws of nature. Miller became a man of prominence in his surrounding. He was elected constable, deputy sheriff, and justice of the peace. During that time, his mother became very concerned after hearing about his change of faith. She prayed and prayed for him and she urged her father and brother-in-law, who were both Baptist preachers, to visit him whenever they can. As mothers and fathers, we ought to continue to pray for our children, especially when we see that they're taking a different route than what we have instructed them. We should never give up because God, sure, he hears our prayers and he is able to do mighty and miraculous things in their lives. Miller started to question his deistic views during the War of 1812, where he volunteered his service. On September 11, 1814, at Plattsburgh, the British Army, with 15,000, outnumbered the Americans with 5,500. The Americans, they were certain of their defeat. However, it was not God's plan. The Americans won the war, 
which was a total shock. Miller also recalled a shell that exploded two feet away from him, which wounded three of his men, but left them intact. Wow, he wondered, does God care? Does he have a personal interest in this country? After the death of his father, he moved back to Lowhampton to help and be near his mother. He began attending church again just to please her, but he would only go when the preacher was present. He did not like to listen to anyone else, which resulted in him volunteering himself to do the reading when the preacher was gone. Two years after the victory at Plattsburgh, a celebration was organized for the veterans. And at the same time, a revival was happening at the church. Instead of going to the veteran celebration, Miller found himself at the revival, which began to stir something in him. When it was his turn to read the sermon the Sunday after, he became so overwhelmed with emotions and could not go on. He then started reading his Bible again. His friends would ridicule him just as he used to ridicule other Christians, but he was determined to prove them wrong or else he would remain a deist. He took care, careful time, little by little, verse by verse, reading the Bible, started from the beginning, Genesis 1, and he would only move on until he understood it well. And that's when Miller found his loving Savior and friend and God's promise to come again to earth. Wow, he saw how many prophetic promises had been fulfilled, then why not this one? During one of his studies, he came across Daniel 8.14, which would totally change the rest of his life. It reads, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. With intense effort, he would study day and night, which led him to the conclusion that the 2,300 days were 2,300 years, and that they began in 457 BC. Inaccurately, he thought that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the end of the world and the coming of Christ, which met in 25 years. Wow, something was pushing him. Go, warn others, go, tell it to the world. But Miller put it off for five years. Occasionally, he would tell some of his friends about the second coming of Christ, but nothing was stopping this calling to preach. But he was afraid. Doesn't that happen to us sometimes? Sometimes we feel the Holy Spirit prompting us to go and tell our friends, our family members, our coworkers about his word, about his love, and his soon coming. Miller delayed God's message, but his burden became unbearable. He could not go on. No, God, no, no, you know I cannot preach. I cannot preach. In his prayer, he said, if it is your will for me to go, I will enter a covenant with you. Open the way, and I mean, if you send me an invitation for, to preach on this particular subject, your second coming, then I will go. We need to be careful when entering into a covenant with God because we might get exactly what we ask for. After the prayer, Miller felt an immediate relief. His burden was gone, and he was quite happy with himself, knowing that no one would ever ask him at 50 years of age to preach on the second coming of the Lord. But little did he know that God had it all prepared. 30 minutes after his prayer, a loud knock was at his door. It was his nephew who came with a message from his father, telling Miller that the minister was unable to speak at church the next morning, and that he would return to home and tell the church about the things he had been studying in the Bible. Miller was so excited. 
And God calls all of us to partake in this movement. Mark 16, verse 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And Matthew 10, verse 7 says, Heaven has come near. Let us continue this work until Christ's return, my brothers and sisters. May God bless you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Good afternoon. <laughs> I, I said good morning earlier. I didn't know what time I'd be speaking this afternoon. Let's um, pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are nothing without you. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to continue to speak to us so that we do not leave this place today without a word from you. I pray this to your dear son's name. Amen. That was a wonderful setup for <laughs> what's coming up for Miller. You kind of know the end of the story, but I'll take you back a little bit, just a few steps back, and let's examine where Miller was when his um, request had been confirmed by God. He had received divine confirmation that God wanted him to preach. So what do you think Miller's response would be? If you asked for a sign from the Lord and he gave you the sign that you asked for, what would be your response? It would be, hallelujah, you know, God is answering my prayers. He speaks to me. He actually spoke to me. Well, this is what Brother Miller did. He turned on his heel without a word, and he stomped out of the kitchen, and he went outside to some garden that was out there. And he spent a whole hour. He said, please, send someone. Time came for him to do it. He really didn't want to do it. And as much as we might want to judge Miller, because we think in hindsight that he had all the signs that he needed, very often we're just like him. And he's not the only one. He's in great company in the Bible because we know there are many great leaders in the Bible who faced a very similar situation. We think of Moses as one of the greatest leaders of all time. And what did Moses do? When he was called, he, he kind of resisted too. He asked God, he said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He forgot that he wasn't the one bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was God who was doing it. He even asked God, like he didn't know, shall I say, send me. And God was patient with Moses. He told him, tell them that the great I am sent you. Yeah. And he said, but what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And what if they say the Lord did not appear to you? You're just making this up. Well, God gave him a few signs. He asked him, what do you have in your hand? And he said he had a rod. And he said, cast that rod down, and that rod became a serpent. Mm -hmm. He also gave him a sign where he put his hand in his breast, and it came out leprous. And then he, he put it back in, and then it was. And Moses was supposed to perform those signs in front of the Pharaoh to let them know that his message came from God. And you would think after all of this, Moses would be convinced, right? I mean, the serpent, the leprous hand, you know, you're talking to God in a burning bush and everything. But he, he wasn't convinced. He said, um, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will speak, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses still said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> That's the greatest, one of the greatest leaders we have in the Bible. This is how he reacted. So what I took from this is that we're not always called upon to do something we feel comfortable with. I've always thought that anything that I'd be called to would be something that I already enjoy and something that I already know how to do. But it doesn't turn out that that happens like that. It didn't happen with Miller. It didn't happen with Moses. And I could name several others. It didn't happen with Jonah. It didn't happen with Gideon. But God is faithful. When he calls you to do something, he equips you with what you need to get it done. Amen. So we thank God that, um, like Moses and with Miller, 
with, like with Moses, Miller's story did not end there. After he communed with God, he finally surrendered. And once he surrendered, he felt happiness. He felt joy that he hadn't felt before. And that's what happens when you yield to God's will. You feel that peace, that joy that comes, that's not even explainable by circumstances, but that comes just because you know you're doing what God wants you to do. He was so happy, he started jumping up and down and praising God. And he was so out of character, his young daughter who saw him ran away calling her mother, saying, come quickly, come quickly. Apparently something is going on with dad. So after that, um, of course, he had just received the invitation from his nephew. So he went back inside and then he proceeded to, you know, to go to the place where he had been called to go. God was merciful to him because he knew that he didn't think of himself as a public speaker. So his very first engagement was in someone's kitchen. And he was able to speak sitting down, not standing up like this, sitting down um, in a, a comfortable armchair where his listeners were around the table with him. And that helped to build his comfort level. And he also made a pact with God saying, I will only go where I'm called. And there was no shortage of calls for him. He had calls from congregationalists. He had calls from Baptists. He had calls from Presbyterians. They were all vying with each other to draw him away from the farm to come and speak in their pulpits. He even had to start printing his sermons and handing them out as pamphlets just to keep up with the demand for what he had to say. We all know, as um, Nathalie mentioned earlier, that Miller was a skeptic. He was a deist before this. And so he had a lot of questions that he had asked, but through his study in the Bible, he had found answers for this. But this came in handy for him later on, because in most of the towns where he went, there were groups of people called infidels. They were even more radical than the deists. So they had all kinds of crazy questions that they asked Miller. But because Miller had that same mind and had sought the answers, he was able to answer them. And in some of those cities, he would baptize almost 100 people, 100 infidels, um, just because of how much he could relate to them. So while he was spreading the word, there was one famous man called James Himes who came to him and said, um, he was impressed with the message. And he said, um, do you really believe this message that you're preaching? Of course he believed it. He's been going around from place to place preaching this message. But he said, if you really believe the world is, you know, that Jesus is coming, what are you doing to spread the message to the big cities? Why are you always staying in the small places? And Miller had some excuses, some, you know, there's nobody to help me and all of that. And James, Hine, John Hine, James Himes said he was going to help him. He signed up to be sort of like an agent for Miller. And he would, get, he would secure invitations from him from um, the top congregations in the big cities. And so very soon, Miller became known all around the nation as a very um, inspiring speaker who had a very timely message for the people. But one thing I also noted was Miller's message was very simple. It was the first angel's message from Revelation 14.7. It said, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Through this message, by 1844, the Methodists had gained about 40,000 new members. The Baptists had gained about 45,000 members. It was so compelling, even the young people were caught up in this. There was one young man who ran into some saloon and said, um, there's a preacher down the street who says the world is coming to an end. Won't you stop your gambling and, run and hear what he has to say? Can you imagine what it would be like today if we had that kind of enthusiasm about the second coming of Christ, where our young people are going into places, breaking in and saying, did you hear that Jesus is coming soon? When the apostles also preached, they preached with a lot of enthusiasm. They had a very simple message too. Their message was straightforward. And this, they talked about the life and the death of Jesus. And they also talked about the saving power of Jesus. When they were asked about, when um, Peter was asked by the prison keeper, what does it take to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. He also said, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So the question I'd like to ask you today is, how confident are you in the message that you're spreading? Have you given yourself some time to sit and think it through? Is it simple? Is it straightforward? Is there urgency to it? 
Are you asking people to do anything with the message that you're giving to them? If you're not doing these things, you're not creating the urgency, you're not doing anything different from what they might have heard, you know, a thousand times before. The Bible says in the last days, this is from Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. It's a message worth spreading. We believe the Lord called Miller to spread the message to the world, and the results were undeniable. In his lifetime, he preached in more than 500 cities and converted over 6,000 souls. He had a true interdenominational movement with leaders from many different churches. Because of this, they had to hold workers' conferences, which I believe is where the general conferences started. And they had planned one year that they were going to have um, three, and they ended up having 31. The next year, they had 40. The next year, they had 50. So God wanted his message to be preached to every corner of the world, to every kindred, kindred tongue, and people. He did not want his message to be confined to a corner. He didn't want that then, and he doesn't want that today. Do you want to stand aside and watch, or would you like to be part of that army? Just remember that God's will will be done. When Jesus was here on earth, when he had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he told the people if they didn't cry out, the rocks would cry out. And the psalmist says in Psalms 19 that nature does declare about God. He says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. Sound, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Do you want to join them? Do you want to join the heavens? Do you want to join them or do you want to sit on the sidelines? My prayer for you and for myself is that we are all part of that group, even the remnant group, who go out there and spread the word that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen. And William Miller and his followers did preach. Now they expected that Jesus would return with between March 21, 1843 and March 21, 1844. And so for a year, they preached, they held camp meetings, they wrote magazine articles, they wrote to newspapers, they let everyone they could know, Jesus is coming this year. By March 21, Jesus is going to come. March 21, 1844, came and went, and nothing happened. Now, can you imagine? Their lives were focused on this. What a disappointment. Do you have things that you expect and they don't happen? They were disappointed, but they found encouragement. In the little book of Habakkuk, there, the prophet Habakkuk was disappointed. Now, Habakkuk's uh, case was, he was part of Jerusalem, and he looked around, he was part of God's kingdom, he looked around, and here was Babylon, the Babylonians, and they were taking over everything. And that just wasn't right. Here were these heathen idol worshipers, and they were getting ready to destroy the nation that God himself had set up. That just doesn't seem right. And so Habakkuk wrote about his complaint, his disappointment. And we're going to look at, at that now. And Katie and I are going to do the best we can to, to have a Habakkuk-like conversation to express the kind of disappointment that we sometimes feel when things don't just seem to work out according to God's, to what we think is God's plan. So if you want to turn with us, Habakkuk ch chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 1 to 4. Act 1, Habakkuk's complaint. Habakkuk 2 verse 1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. 
and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I'm reproved. It sure seems like a long time since I came into this church. Richard's mom invited me to an evangelistic series. She was this wacko Adventist, always talking about Jesus and how soon he was coming back. And I, I can hear her voice still in my head, constantly. Helen White says this, Helen White says that. And the whole time I'm thinking, who is Ellen White, and why do I care what she says? What is this craziness? Well, she's gone now, and God rest her soul, we're all still here. Just like William Miller and all those believers with him, they're all gone. All these people looking for the soon return of Jesus, gone. Sometimes I wonder, is God really involved in our lives? Are these teachings ever going to come to pass? Maybe he's just sitting back and watching everything. But it seems to me that God should already have taken care of this mess. <laughs> well, I try to do my part but to keep up hope, but sometimes it's discouraging. I, I mean, aren't we his children? Why do we have to suffer so much? Why do the rotten people get ahead of us? You know, I, I know so many people who lie and cheat and use other people, and yet they want for nothing. They have financial security, a nice place to live. I, just, I don't get it. Doesn't he care? I wonder what God has to say about this. I sure wish he'd explain it to me. Act 2, God replies. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. My dear Katie, believe me, I do care. I was there when you were born. I know every hair on your head. I know every anxious moment you've ever been through. Here's what I want you to do. Pay attention to all those prophecies. God, is, is that you? You do listen. Well, I have some of those prophecies, you know, the, the red books at home, and we study them sometimes in Sabbath school and seminars, and I, I participate. Those are good things, but when I speak of recording the vision and inscribing it on tablets, I'm not asking you to take some notes, but to live them out. I want you to live your faith out loud. And I promise you this, when you live your faith, other people will be blessed, just like you were, because Richard's mom lived her faith out loud. But God, how long are we going to have to put up with this? You know, sometimes I get really discouraged. I just get so fed up. Act 3, God assures, Habakkuk 2, verse 3, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, and it will not delay. The plan I'm working on has been established from the very foundation of the world. Wait till you see my plan I have for you, Katie. <laughs> you will love the home I'm preparing for you. We are rapidly closing in on this final phase. My plan will not fail. Well, if I were sitting in heaven, maybe it would seem like we're rushing toward the end, but I'm not in heaven. I'm here on earth, and I have bills to pay, and no money to pay them, and health issues, and I'm dealing with jerks who hurt me, and it, you know, sometimes I just I feel so all alone, and it's like no one's listening. Remember what my son Jesus taught you. During these troubled times, live one day at a time. I'll provide you with your daily needs and learn how to wait. That's an interesting word, wait. You should look it up in the dictionary. Look at its origin for ideas on how to do it. Okay, I will. 
but it's still not fair that the jerks seem to get ahead. Act four, the master chef speaks of what stinks. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. I know that what those people are doing is wrong, and <laughs> even they know it sometimes, but they seem to have much easier and much better lives. Don't be fooled by their appearance. Proud, selfish, greedy people, they look good on the outside, but they stink with a most foul odor. They're rotten to the core. If you could smell them like I smell them, you would run away. You wouldn't see the attraction. I'm building a community of companions who will like each other forever. People who learn how to live by simple trust will like each other forever. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, God, and, and to encourage me. I, I need that. And thank you for sharing Habakkuk's complaint. I do want to live forever with you and with friends that I trust. And Katie, I want to live forever with you. <laughs> friends, I invite you to live by faith. Don't get caught up in all the things that the world offers. People consumed by things lose their very humanity. God explains it in our last verse, Habakkuk 2, verse 5. Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. While we wait for God to fulfill his plans, let's not run after those things. Let's learn to care for each other, care for the people we work with, we go to school with, care for the people we live with, and let's let them know that we care. And let's be content with those daily blessings God gives us while we wait. the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, we read these words. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, Jesus depicts his church just before his return to earth. An inordinate delay had caused those who were looking for his return to slumber and sleep. All slept, the wise and the foolish. <laughs> At the hour of his midnight cry, it was given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. This announcement is known as the midnight cry. The Midnight Cry was first preached by the Advent Movement in the summer of 1844. 
The church was about to make shipwreck of faith. They had done the will of God in following his guidance <clears throat> and, the, and the guidance of his spirit in his word. Yet they could not understand his purpose in their recent past experience, nor could they discern the pathway before them, and they were tempted to doubt whether God had indeed been leading them. They had preached that Jesus would return in the spring of 1844. He did not come at that time. They had seen the prophecies unsealed and, the, and rapidly fulfilling signs telling that the coming of Christ was near. They had walked, as it were, by sight, but now bowed down by disappointed hopes. They could stand only by faith in God and in his word. The scoffing world were saying <clears throat> and telling them, you have been deceived. Give up your faith and say that the Advent movement was of Satan. But God's word declared, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. To renounce their faith now and deny the power of the Holy Ghost which had attended the message would be drawing back toward perdition. They were encouraged to steadfastness by the words in Habakkuk 2 and verse 3, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, mm -hmm. but, at the, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Their only safe course was to cherish the light which they had already been given and received from God, hold fast to his promises, and continue to search the scriptures and patiently wait and watch to receive further light. So it is for all of God's people, when disappointed, when confused, when in despair, go to the word and stand on the word, his true will enlighten your path. It was August of 1844 that the leaders of the Advent movement recalculated the time of Jesus' appearing. The due date was to take place on October 22, 1844. The process of re-reckoning the date gave power and impetus to the message of the midnight cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. It was at the Exeter, New Hampshire camp meeting that Elder Snow spoke in place of Elder Bates. He had a message for God's people and he reasoned. When Jesus came the first time, he came on time. The time is fulfilled, mm -hmm. Jesus said in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. What time was fulfilled? It was the 69th week of the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. From the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there would be 69 weeks of years on 483 years to the Messiah, the Prince. <laughs> and Jesus <laughs> and Jesus began his ministry in 27 AD, exactly 483 years from the command. This fact established that the 2,300-day-year prophecy of Daniel 8, which also began in 457 B.C., would end in 1844. For the 70 weeks were cut off from that 2,300-year prophecy. 
Now, we have always taught, as Adventists, that the 2300 days year prophecy began in the spring of 457 B.C. and ended in the spring of 1844. But the scripture says, from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. But the command did not take place on the first day, the first week, or the first month of 457 B.C. But it did take place that year. Ezra 7.8 tells us that the decree reached Jerusalem on the fifth month of the year, Jewish year, at least five months after the beginning of the year. Then we were wrong to expect Christ to return in the spring or the beginning of the year of 1844 because the command did not go forth in the year until at least five months later, Snow said. Point one. Point two. Snow went on. Now, the next truth we need to understand is a fuller understanding of the spring and autumn types in the law of Moses. In the Old Testament, the principal festival of the spring was the Passover ceremony. Held in the very first month of the Jewish year, which coincides with our months of March and April. The principal festival in the autumn and fall of each year in the ceremonial law was the Day of Atonement. It took place in the 10th month of the seventh day in the Jewish year. Now, understand this. Jesus died on the Passover festival on the very day the Passover lamb was slain. Christ, our Passover, Corinthians said, Paul says in Corinthians, was crucified for us in the first month, in the spring of the year, on the very day when the Passover lamb was slain. Just as it was in the Passover festival of the ceremonial law. And that's not all. At what time of the day was the Passover lamb slain? The Bible says between the evenings, meaning not at sundown or at noon, but between those two. Christ, our Passover lamb, yielded up his life about 3 o'clock on Good Friday, between the evenings, the mid-afternoon. He died as our Passover lamb in the very year foretold by Daniel's prophecy, on the very day set forth in the ceremonial law, at the very hour prescribed in the law. Hallelujah. Now, the Day of Atonement is the principal autumn festival in the ceremonial law. It comes in the fall. It was on that day every year that the high priest cleanse the sanctuary. Daniel 8.14 says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The work that Jesus will do at the end of the 2,300 years would be to cleanse the sanctuary or this earth, they believe. Does it not follow, Snow says, that the time will be just as precisely regarded when our high priest fulfills the cleansing of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement as it was precisely fulfilled on the Passover, not only in the year, but on the exact date of the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement falls on the 10th day of the seventh month. By the most careful reckoning preserved in the Lord's providence by the Jewish calendar, the tenth day of the seventh month falls on October 22nd, 1844, Snow said. The church had been asleep, but now it was awake. Matthew 24, 14 says that this gospel of the kingdom 
shall be preached to all the world, and then shall the end come. What a daunting task to give the Lord's cry and to preach the loud cry and to preach the gospel to the entire world. In three months, impossible many may have felt. But still yet, they went forward in the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they realized that the battle was not there. It's the Lord. And once the Sunday law passes, many today will realize it is time for the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That cry in 1844 was only a type of the primary fulfillment, which is to take place in the future. It will be at midnight, the Bible says. Midnight in the physical world. Midnight in the social world. Midnight in the political world. And midnight in the Christian's spiritual world. A time of trouble, the Bible says, such as never was since there was a nation. Once again, saints, it will appear impossible in the hour of such darkness for the gospel to be preached to all the world. But church, don't fear, don't fret, nor fall into despair. Just remember the battle is the Lord's. It's not yours. The story is told of two young men, two young boys, who were attending junior high school. They had to go to school that day. Uh, they dreaded it. Why? Because there was a bully at the school, a bigger kid with big muscles who could fight real well. This bully came to them each day that they came to school and told them, give me half of your lunch money. I need something to eat. Uh, and so they, day by day, gave him the money. But on this day, the small one, Michael, told Mark, his friend, I'm not giving him my money today. I'm going to take it and buy some things that I want to get. So when the bully came up to him and said, give me your money, he said, no, I'm not giving you my money. I'm keeping it. The bully looked at Mark and said, are you giving me your money? He said, no, I'm not giving you my money either. And the bully said, it's going to be, it's going to be bad for you two at the end of school today. On your way home, I'm going to beat the both of you up. So they left the bully. Michael said to Mark, Mark, can you go up to the high school at lunchtime? Do you have any time? He said, yeah, I have a little time. He said, go up to the high school and tell my big brother that the bully is going to beat us up after school. So when noon came, Mark went up to the high school and he told his brother, and, and the brother didn't, but it was seeming like he didn't pay that much attention to him, but he, he looked over to Mark and he said, tell my brother, help is on the way. So the school day went on. Mark came back and he told Mike that, and the school day went on, and it ended, and they were on their way home. When all of a sudden they looked ahead, and there was that big bully coming at them. And when he got about 10 feet from them, little old Mike ran and just lit into that bully. With all his strength, he began to fight it. And Mark tried to help a little bit, but he wasn't very strong. And the bully was getting the best of the two of them when all of a sudden the crowd that was surrounding them that was annoyed, who made Michael's big brother had showed up. And he made short work of the bully as he dragged him through the streets and beat him up. As the boys were making their way home, Mark said to Michael, he said, Michael, what made you so brave that you were able to, to just light into that bully like that when he came, you know, before he even got to us? And Michael said, why, why you did, Mark. You told me that my elder brother said help was on the way. 
You see, church, we've got a bully out there. His name is the devil. And he's been bullying us day in and day out. He's been taking our lunch money every day so that we can't eat. And we're tired of it. He's been destroying our families. Every time we try to obey God and do his will, he tries to block us and keep us from, be, from doing God's will. We got a bully out there. But we don't want to keep our eyes on the bully. You know, Moses told Israel, Israel, when the bully was coming in the name of Pharaoh, Moses told, told the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't look at the bully, look at God. You see, we got that elder brother up there. Jesus Christ, he defeated Satan in heaven. He said, I saw him fall like lightning. He defeated Satan on earth when he lived a godly, holy, sanctified life and died on the cross. And his last victory will be to defeat Satan in your life and in my life. We don't have to worry about Satan, the big bully, because help is on the way. <laughs> it was at midnight. It was at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. you to stand with us as we sing our closing song. Lord, let your light, let your grace, let your love fall on us. Let your light light of your face shine on us. Lord, let your light, light of your face shine on us. Sing with us. That we may be saved.
the most delightful, interesting, generous being in the universe would love to spend the day with you. Would you like to invite him to come and spend the day with you? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath day that you bless and set aside to spend with us, your children. Please do come and walk with us. We ask in Jesus' name. Just a couple more announcements. If we missed you, high school, college, university graduates, come on down for your gift if we missed you earlier in the service. Also, the baptism at 3 and the last final meeting at White Rock Lake at 4. If you can join for that, that would be great. Bulletin at the back of your bulletin is the address for the White Rock Lake Church. Have a happy Sabbath.